On June 12, 2023, 13-year-old James Yablonski packed three bags, took his father's cell phone, and walked out of his home at 12.52 a.m. He put his belongings into his father's van, got in, and drove away. The next morning, the van was found abandoned on the highway near Devil's Lake State Park in Baraboo, Wisconsin, over 25 miles from James Reedsburg home. A search of the state park immediately commenced, and clues that James left behind made many think that this missing persons case would have a swift conclusion. But now, over eight months later, James still hasn't been found. Online speculation has run rampant, with everyone in Wisconsin and beyond asking, what could have happened to James Yablonski? When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of James Yablonski. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us once again. I'm Kona. And I'm Ethan. And we're the husband and wife team behind this podcast. Each week, I tell you the story of an unsolved missing persons case. Ethan doesn't know anything about this case going into the episode, and he is here to provide his reactions and questions in real time, hopefully asking some of the same ones that you have at home. Hopefully. Hopefully. This week, we are covering an extremely recent case. We don't do these very often simply because the vast majority of missing persons cases are resolved quickly. As I said in the intro, this one appeared as though it would be as well. So this one I did hear about pretty quickly after it happened. It didn't seem like something that would be going on as long as it has. You know, this kid was 13 and he stole his dad's van and his cell phone. Yeah, and his cell phone. And and so it's like, okay, well, this kid is, you know, clearly going through something. He'll come home or he'll be found or, you know, whatever. Right. They can track the cell phone maybe. Yeah, exactly. Like they'll find the, va- like, you know, whatever it was. It just seemed as though, yes, this is terrifying for the family, obviously. Um, but it's not something that I thought that we would be talking about. But here we are. Um, We had a listener actually suggest this case to us. And, you know, when I read the email that said, hey, you should cover the James Yablonski case, I didn't recognize the name at first. And then, you know, they sent a link to one of the recent news articles and I clicked on it. I was like, oh, my God, like I couldn't believe that he hasn't been found because, you know, I wasn't I wasn't following it very closely. So you just assumed that. Yeah, I it just had been assumed, resolved. Yeah, in some exactly. Way. Exactly. And um, it has not. And so, you know, I decided like, okay, well, let's dig into it. And it just got so bizarre that I thought that, you know, we should talk about it. So here we are. So now let's get into the story of James Yablonski. James Yablonski was born on December 3rd, 2009 to Rebecca Schlitt and Bill Yablonski. Now, even that little bit of basic information um, that I start every single episode we do with was extremely hard to find. So yeah, Bill, his dad, I talk about a lot in this. He's the one who's been kind of, you know, the, the face of the family Mm -hmm. in this case. Um, But I could not find a single source, including his name is page that had James's birthday on it. That's bizarre why yeah. i don't know and i couldn't find any information about his mother including her name and then finally there is one article from november of 2023 that had both pieces of information so i like i was able to go back and rewrite this that's really random yeah it it's weird and that's one of the things that struck me about this case and we kind of talk about it is 
how little we actually know about James himself. So while I don't have many details about James's life, this is what I've been able to find and kind of cobble together. Bill Yablonski is about 20 years older than James's mother, Rebecca. So he's currently in his like mid to late 50s. She's currently in her late 30s. Okay. Bill has a daughter from a previous relationship. She lives in Michigan and she's an adult with children of her own. So I don't know who her mother is, you know, what the situation is there, but she's in Michigan, they're in Wisconsin. Bill and Rebecca, I don't know when they got married, but they ended up having four children together, three boys and a girl. James's sister, the girl, is the youngest, and she was born in 2014. Now, I only know that because there's a hospital photo of the three boys with their mother and baby sister, you know, like right after her birth. Uh And so I just that's the only thing I know is that the three boys are already there. The baby was born in 2014. That's all I've got on that. Now, Bill and Rebecca, according to public records, divorced in 2018. And this is why we don't know really anything about her. Because according to Bill, and according to what, you know, any reporters have been able to find out, she's no longer involved in her kids' lives at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. From what I could find, she still lives in Wisconsin, but has not seen them in years, apparently. And Bill said in that, like, November article that I was talking about, that he hasn't heard from her at all since James went missing. Well, that's suspicious. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's unfortunate. I don't know how suspicious it is. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, you know, toward the end, but that's kind of the family dynamic that we're starting off with. Bill is a single father of four and a business owner. Now, it's clear that there are significant issues related to the children's mother. I mean, we don't know what those issues are, but when a mother doesn't have contact with her four young children, there are some sort of issues there. We just don't know what. Do we know is that uh, like court mandated or she just doesn't have contact? We don't know what the nature of it is at all. So we don't know the impact that this has had on the children either. Right. Right. Bill has described himself as a strict parent, but one who loves his children and does his best to provide for them. So in June 2023, James had just finished up seventh grade. School had just gotten out. And this is part of why this story is so compelling and just bizarre, because James is so young. Do we know where he is in the lineup? I don't. So I actually don't because that's the other thing. So I told you, like, I really just don't know much about his life at all before he went missing. So I found both his mother's Facebook profile and his father's Facebook profile. His mother has pictures of the kids up till 2018 when the divorce happened. So they're all young. And his father doesn't appear to use Facebook like a whole lot. He has like 175 friends or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I could only see his public posts, but he also doesn't frequently post pictures of the kids. So the most recent one I could find was from like 2018. And the three boys all look alike. Uh, Like, I can't tell them apart. So I don't know which is James. They all are like very tall and skinny and two of the three have glasses um, and they all have shaved heads. Like they all look very, very similar. So I don't know where he is in that lineup. Gotcha. So this is what we do know about James. On June 12th, 2023, he left with his school backpack and two other bags He took his father's cell phone and he drove his father's van away. Now, what happened after that is certainly up for interpretation and debate, but the actual act of James leaving the home alone was caught on his father's outdoor security camera. As I mentioned in the intro, this was 1252 a.m. when he left the house. He sat in the van for seven minutes before pulling away and driving off. 
Surveillance cameras show the van arriving at his father's business in Wisconsin Dells, which is about seven miles away from the home. Now, the strange thing is that he arrived just after 3 a.m. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he leaves the house. The timestamp of him walking away is 1252. According to his father, you know, and investigators, he sits there for like seven minutes. So he leaves around 1 a.m. Right. right. But it takes him over two hours to make a seven-mile drive. Right. But he has his father's cell phone so who knows what he was doing in between that so i mean he's got a gps readily available this is last year or so yeah and so police because it was his father's cell phone and not you know his cell phone for instance and he wasn't an adult who had his own cell phone plan like police were able to get the cell phone records pretty quickly and easily so police i'm sure know what happened during that time period, but they haven't released it. So in terms of the public timeline, we know that he left the house at about 1 a.m., got to the business at about 3. And the business is, um, it. from what I understand, it looks as though his father um, like repairs and sells golf carts. That's kind of what it was. So he goes to the business and stays there for 54 minutes. And it is believed that during that time, James was able to get into the office and access one of his father's safes. Now, he didn't get into the safe and take money or anything like that. Instead, he went in and took a 380 semi-automatic pistol. Oh, that's not a good sign. So we have a 13-year-old with a stolen van, a cell phone, and a gun. Now, this, of course, is an information that Bill immediately had when he woke up that morning. He just realized that James wasn't in the house, you know, after trying to get him up or doing whatever he was doing with his brothers. and Normal morning Yeah, just normal, like, having kids stuff, right? So he realized James isn't there, and he's like, where on earth is he? He looks outside, sees that his van is gone. So he puts two and two together, doesn't know exactly what's going on, but he calls the police and reports his son missing and his van missing at around 9 a.m. After Bill reported his son missing, it was determined that police had actually already located the van. Okay. It was parked on the side of Highway 12 near Baraboo Bluffs, right by Devil's Lake State Park. And the van was found around 4.45 a.m., So I'm just trying to piece together the timeline. So leaves the house at almost, or no, he leaves the house at one in the morning, gets to his father's business at three, spends, you said about 55 minutes. Yeah. So now it's almost four, almost four. And then they find the car or the van at 445. Yeah. Which would have been Almost right after he left it. Yeah, because you said it was, what, 25, 27 miles? Yeah, something like that. So, yeah. Actually, from from the business, it was a little bit further. It was like 30 miles or 35 miles or something like that. Because so where they lived in Reedsburg, the business was like seven miles basically north of that. And then he had to go south, basically pass by his house and continue south to the park. So when the cops find the van, it's 10 to 15 minutes after, you know, supposedly he parked it. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. But time has been a little weird uh, from news article to news article. So I'm not putting 100% faith in that exact time. So I have read a couple of sources that said that they had found the van prior to to Bill reporting James missing, but I'm not, I I wouldn't put a hundred percent stock in that like 446 AM time. Okay. Well, I mean, even if they found the van that, you know, they didn't know they were, that it was tied to a missing person's case. Exactly. And when it's, you know, that time of the morning, like it makes sense that they wouldn't have contacted 
the owner yet either, oh, yeah, you no. know, because like you just see a car parked on the side of the road. You're not going to like wake up the owner in the middle of the night and be like, oh, my God, your car is on the side of the road. Like, you know, who right. cares? Right. Yeah. Like you ran out of gas, whatever. So in this case, because now we're kind of going back to like the Phoenix Colding case, right, right. where yeah. it was insane that they didn't alert the owner and they just like towed it. Um, but this wasn't that situation they figured it out very quickly and it was found like i said at a very odd time of day by that morning they put it all together the investigators had a starting point and then they were further aided by cell phone location data which like i said they were able to get very quickly and this helped them find their first major clue a makeshift campsite Now, this campsite was in the park, not too far from where the van had been left on the side of the road. At this campsite, investigators found several changes of clothes, a pillow, a phone charger, and a backpack. Now, they didn't allow Bill to go to the campsite, but they took photos of the items, and then Bill positively ID'd them as belonging to his son. Bill's cell phone was also found about 200 yards west of the van on the opposite side of the highway. So finding the cell phone wasn't a great sign. Yeah. But the campsite gave people hope that James was nearby and would be found soon. Between 50 to 75 police officers searched the area all day on the 12th, hoping to find out where James had gone. Officers were assigned to stay in the area of the campsite overnight, and the official search resumed the next day, which was Tuesday, at around 6 a.m. Officers were split into two groups, with one group staying near the area of the campsite and the other group heading south. Now, Devil's Lake State Park is the most popular state park in Wisconsin, and it's not only massive at over 9,000 acres— But it's dangerous with high bluffs and thick brush that made the search incredibly difficult. So one of the officers who was searching said that, like, another officer could be six or eight feet away and you wouldn't be able to see them. Wow, really? Yeah. That's crazy. Right. Because of this, it was quickly determined that more resources were needed. The Wisconsin Department of Justice issued a statewide endangered person alert The Department of Natural Services offered air support via airplane, and Wisconsin Emergency Management sent out a Black Hawk helicopter. On the ground, a canine unit was brought in to assist. Now, even though James appeared to be a runaway, and we've seen many, many cases in which law enforcement doesn't particularly care about finding runaways, police were working hard to find him for a few reasons. One, the terrain was extremely dangerous, as I mentioned, which made him just endangered by default, you know, having believed to have been out there. And two, Bill had realized by this point that a gun gun was missing. Yeah. And this is also why police discouraged civilians from joining the search and instead asked for additional officers from a neighboring county. So, like, for instance, when they were doing this initial search, they obviously had all these officers, but they had a bunch of firefighters who would come out to join in the search. But they sent them home and just got more officers instead. On the first day or two of the search, police were treating James's case as basically a runaway situation that had gotten out of hand, thinking that he had taken the gun for protection. But a few posts on Facebook would make people wonder if that was actually the reason. On a Facebook post made by the Sauk County Sheriff's Office, and that's the county where the state park is where the van was found, on June 12th, two people who claimed to be friends with James posted comments. They said that James had made concerning posts on his Snapchat story the night before. One of these Facebook comments read, quote, He's one of my best friends, and I really hope they find him, and he's safe. And I just want to let everyone know that he did post on his Snapchat story last night, saying he wanted to commit suicide, in case that helps and no one has heard from him since. End quote. So then, I mean, so if suicide is his intention, why take his dad's cell phone? Why take any of it? Well, I mean, I suppose like if he wanted to commit suicide in that state park for whatever reason, he would need means of transportation to get there. 
Right. But would he need several changes of clothes and a pillow and, right? you know. And what was he doing for those two hours in between leaving the house and getting to his dad's business, which was only seven miles away? If suicide is his intention, he went there to get the gun, nothing else. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions. Exactly. Like I can I can see him again if the state park holds some sort of meeting meaning to him, and that's why he was going there. Mode of transportation takes his dad's phone so that he's got a GPS to get him around. But again, there's that gap previous to getting the the gun. Why take multiple articles of clothing? Why camp the night? There's a lot there. Yeah, there, and that's the thing. And that this is just the beginning of all of the the confusion and the questions. Now, according to Bill, he didn't know that James even had a Snapchat account. But at some point during the investigation, either he or police were able to obtain at least one video that James had made. Now, James is not seen in this video. Instead, his phone is pointed at the dashboard of the van as he's driving it. While he doesn't overtly come out and say that he wants to commit suicide, like the commenter said, his words certainly are concerning. So here's the audio. Who cares about me? It's not their fault. It's no one's fault. It's my fault. I I feel like I want to explain it. But all in a while, I'm scared, I'm sad. I have no emotions anymore. I've lost them. I, I'm not processing anything. My brain is something happened to it. So at face value, this does sound like he could be having suicidal thoughts. So you said that it was... The, the footage was uh, facing the dash of the van. Was this posted while he was driving around? That's what it seems like, yeah. So after he took the van. Right. And he says it's not his fault, it's my fault. He, yeah, he says it's not anyone's fault, it's his fault. And then something's wrong with my brain. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty concerning. It's concerning, it's compelling evidence that definitely points towards suicide, but... If that's the case, again, why pack three bags and what's with the campsite and why were the dogs unable to find any trace of him? Now, for his part, Bill did not believe that James's goal was to end his life. And this is partly because he didn't believe that his son was suicidal. Sure. But partly because of two other items that were missing from their home, two wilderness survival guides. Hmm. So at this point, the question became, was James trying to live off the grid inside of the state park? On Thursday, day four of the investigation, investigators found more clues that could point to this theory. About 200 yards southwest of the campsite they found on Monday, they found a boot print, two sandwich bags, and a walking stick. Sauk County Sheriff's Office Patrol Lieutenant Stephen Schramm told reporters, quote, It does seem like we're making some progress today. We're excited to find something to give us a renewed sense of confidence or hope. But at this point, we're still pushing diligently forward, end quote. The next day, Friday, they found a pair of socks and a knife sheath that had been dropped next to the socks. Although they couldn't be positively identified as belonging to James, neither looked as though they had been there for long. Shram also said that he had been told that James had previously expressed interest in wilderness survival and living off the grid. The books that he had taken were a gift from his father because he had talked about stuff like this. Mm. And apparently they went camping pretty frequently. Now, James had never gone camping on his own or anything like that. But like this was right before Father's Day and they went camping on Father's Day every year and usually for several weekends throughout the summer. As the days went on, investigators began to worry that without a cell phone, James could be injured somewhere in the state park with no way of contacting anyone for help. Shram went on to say, quote, He is likely in possession of one of a series of books entitled Living Off the Grid, which has information in it to survive in the woods by yourself, including water filtration, how to build camps. Some of that is what's leading us to believe that the structures that we're finding are probably left by James because they're built in a way that mirrors what was in that book, end quote. 
Okay, so this is the first time he's said that they've found structures. Right. And I've never seen photos of these structures or anything like that. The photos that I have seen, I mean, one was just basically like the backpack in the woods and like a pile of clothes. Mm -hmm. And then they took the photo basically, you know, back at the police station or wherever of the actual items. But yeah, I haven't seen any of these structures that he's mentioning. So I can't really tell you what they look like. Mm hmm. Though they obviously didn't find the boy himself, police were hopeful that he would return to the area where they keep on finding these things. So they actually set up trail cameras with the hope of catching him on video if he did. Searches continued, but despite these early signs of life, no other evidence of James was found. Bill made a public post on Facebook on June 23rd that he was gathering people to do a search on his own. The days turned into weeks, and by the time James had been missing for a month, police were still pushing the survivalist theory. Bill, however, wasn't so sure. Bill told WKOW, quote, He is a smart kid. This is uncalled for to do something like this and not talk to anybody about it, end quote. By the two-month mark, Bill was ready to elaborate on his theory of what actually happened the night that his son walked out of their house. Now, this is also the time, two months into it, where the FBI administered a polygraph to Bill, which he passed. They apparently also gave other family members um, polygraphs, but I don't know specifically who. But obviously, Bill, being the father, being the one, the the one adult who was living in the house, was obviously considered to be a suspect by many people. Got to roll him out. Exactly. So while talking to reporters afterward, he said that he understood why he had to take the polygraph test and said that basically everyone is a suspect until they're not. But he reiterated that despite what some were speculating online, he had nothing to do with James's disappearance. Instead, he believed that somebody had lured the 13-year-old away. It's a possibility. Yeah, and we didn't hear much more about Bill's theory for a few months. And those few months, like August to November, there were very few updates People in like different Facebook groups and stuff would keep on asking for updates. They'd be like commenting on old posts, things like that. Reporters would try to reach the sheriff's department and ask about new searches, but they weren't getting their emails and phone calls returned. It was just kind of radio silence for a while. But in November, Bill did an interview with ABC affiliate WISN in which he said that in his heart, he believed his son was still alive. This interview came after further revelations that after searching more electronic devices, including his school-issued Chromebook, that James had made several searches for means to travel out of state. He also searched for specific locations within the state of Wisconsin. Is one of those locations his mother's? They didn't say anything about that. Bill said that he believes that James is being held against his will somewhere out of state and that the reason the dogs never got a hit during the initial search is because the campsite police found was made specifically to throw off the investigation. Bill doesn't believe that James actually stayed there. He said, quote, the dogs never did hit on anything. And that tells me somebody or he went in there, set that stuff out, sat down on the ground and waited for somebody to honk a horn. He came back out the same way he went in and got in a car. Plausible theory. Yeah. And apparently the campsite was definitely close enough to the highway that that would work, that you would be able to hear somebody honking a horn at you. So, yes, it's plausible, but it may also be wishful thinking of a father who doesn't want to believe the worst. But he does have a point. The way the items were scattered about is strange And Bill says that the clothes that were found were ones that James never wore. He said that there were other clothes missing from James's wardrobe, and he believes that there's another duffel bag out there full of James's actual clothes. And you also, again, can't overlook the fact that the dogs didn't pick up any scent. Yeah. Police also had air support with heat-seeking technology, and they 
also didn't pick up anything. And this search got started pretty quickly. I mean, we're not talking days later. Right. You know, if he got there, let's say around four in the morning, give or take, four, four thirty in the morning, he was reported missing at nine. I mean, the search kicked off, you know, probably a few hours later. Like, that's not a ton of time for a 13-year-old boy to get that far away on foot. Right. Or for animals to drag him away or anything like exactly. that. Exactly. And again, this is, like, yes, animals can do things like that anywhere where you're around wild animals. But, like, this is a state park, a state park where people hike and, you know, camp and, like, yeah, it's... No, th- there's certainly uh, credence to his theory. Yeah, Absolutely. In a November 10th interview with the Chippewa Herald, Bill dropped a bombshell. And I've only seen this information in this like particular interview. I haven't seen this elsewhere. And I actually almost missed it. According to Bill, James actually had a second cell phone with him. Was it his own? I think it was. Now, this phone didn't have a SIM card, but it could make calls via Wi-Fi. Oh. His cell phone, Bill's cell phone, could be used as a Wi-Fi hotspot. So his belief is that James took his phone so that he could use it as a hotspot and then make phone calls or send messages with the second phone. Interesting. And, you know, to your point earlier, probably use Bill's phone as a GPS. Right. Now, as I mentioned, Bill's phone was recovered the first day. And it's still in the custody of the sheriff's department. But according to Bill, the second phone remains unaccounted for. So with all of this, it could be possible that James did, in fact, have help leaving. And everything else, the campsite, the gun, the Snapchat video, maybe those were all just red herrings. Seems kind of elaborate. Yeah, I mean, it definitely doesn't sound like something a 13-year-old would come up with on his own. But whether or not the evidence that James left behind was intentionally misleading, it has caused investigators, James' family, and online sleuths to all go in different directions. If you look at any message board about this case, you can find people passionately arguing all of the theories that we've talked about so far. While investigators seem to have stuck to the survivalist theory, that possibility certainly became more dire as the weather turned colder. Like, we're talking about Wisconsin here. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was like 95 degrees or whatever when he went missing, but it snows, it gets cold there. Right. And surviving alone, regardless of how many wilderness manuals you have would be incredibly difficult for anyone, much less a 13-year-old boy. Yeah, I mean, even a skilled survivalist would have difficulty in that environment. Deer hunting season starts in the area in mid-November, and police urged hunters to keep a lookout for anything suspicious. Bill continued to believe that his son was being held out of state and consulted psychics who told him that they saw James getting into a car and believed that he could be in Colorado or Montana. Investigators have asked law enforcement in those states to keep an eye out for James, but they were clear in saying that they don't believe that these psychics are credible witnesses. But the fact is, they don't have any credible witnesses. As of this recording, in February 2024, it's been eight months since James snuck out of his house in the middle of the night and disappeared. Aside from the surveillance video from those early morning hours, there have been no further sightings of the teenager. Investigators have interviewed James' friends, family, and classmates, but none of them have given any indication as to where James could be. While his mother, Rebecca, has refused to talk to reporters or her ex-husband, detectives were able to interview her, and they have seemingly determined that she doesn't have any information that is relevant to the case. Okay, I was wondering if they actually did that. They did, and that took a long time to, you know, kind of figure out. Nothing that I was reading was even mentioning her at all. So it was kind of hard to figure that out. But yeah, like, apparently she is just still uninvolved. So they don't believe that 
she had anything to do with it. They don't believe that any of the other family members had anything to do with it. And same with Bill. He says he doesn't suspect anybody in their lives. You know, this case is just so interesting for for a lot of reasons. And, you know, it always happens when I'm researching these cases. Elements remind me of other ones that we've covered, right? right? Yeah. And we have covered so many stories of young men who disappear, leaving behind an abandoned car, usually yeah. crashed. Yeah, not not crashed in this case. Not crashed in this case, but like... You know, this is very much like Priceless Beast or Logan Schindelman or, you know, any of these where they're driving and then they're gone. But it also reminds me of Mason Smith, where, you know, he was a teenager who was upset and seemingly left on his own volition. And, you know, one of the main theories is that he took his own life, but in his case, went into the desert. And then again, I'm also... Reminded of Alicia Navarro, who, as we recently found out, was, in fact, lured away by an online predator. Right. But uh, I mean, wasn't there evidence of that? Not really. No, it was just a theory. I mean, there's evidence of it now. But no, Uh, at the time of her disappearance, that was just the theory that they had. And it turned out to be correct. And thankfully, she was found you know, several years later, she was found in 2023 and has now reunited with her family. But in James's case, I don't I don't know what happened. I think that all of these theories are possibilities in his case. Yeah, I mean, the survivalist one is becoming less and less likely, but it's still potentially a possibility. Yeah. And it just sounds like that that area is so dense and so difficult to tr- to traverse that it could be possible that something happened to him out there and he hasn't been found. Right. All of these possibilities kind of fit. Nothing really a hundred percent fits though. We don't know what was going on in James's head when he walked out of his house on June 12th, 2023. We don't know if he was thinking of ending his own life or having an adventure in the woods, or if he was lured away by someone with nefarious intentions. All we know is that a 13-year-old boy is out there somewhere without his family, and he needs to be found. Hopefully, by keeping his name and story out there, his loved ones will get the answers they so desperately need. James Yablonski has been missing from Baraboo, Wisconsin, since June 12, 2023. He is a white male with brown hair and blue eyes. He was 5'11 and approximately 120 pounds at the time of his disappearance. He has a half-inch long scar on the back of his neck. James was 13 when he went missing. He would be 14 today. Anyone with information regarding James Yablonski's disappearance can contact Bill Yablonski at 920 292 0322 or at William Yablonski at yahoo.com. You can also contact the Salt County Sheriff's Office at 608 355 4495 or Salt County Crime Stoppers at 888 847 7285. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. Be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and TikTok. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!